This is the Tabernacle Podcast with John Vermilion and me, Britton Bishop. What's up, John? 99. <sighs> 99 bottles. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, 99. <laughs> 99. Uh, you were thinking 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Yeah. Uh, yeah this is episode 99. So I got 99 on the brain, but I was thinking, because I'm a child of the 80s, Gen X rules forever, uh, 99 Red Luff Balloons. Red. Yeah. It's a random, yeah. random tune that just jumped in my head, Love dude. It. 99 red <laughs> no singing Sorry. 99 yeah 99 episodes it started crazy. as like hey let's let's see if this works i think we even make it to 10 yeah <laughs> 99 episodes crazy i wonder one meeting how many <laughs> we've had one me- a lot of texts a lot of texts one, one meeting. meeting one meeting how many miles is it between here and manistee oh i don't know i drive 50 or something like that yeah 45 40 miles i'm miles yeah. i think it's like 50 do you want to map quest it real quick can we map, get a producer you just map? proved how old you are. You just Not said MapQuest. Map Quest. Quest. No, ma- <laughs> dude, I call everything. Dude, it's my little map app. Uh, yeah. Map Quest. How many miles? Yeah. Yeah, you tell me. I have no idea. I'm going to say 50 for the sake of math that I won't be able to do anyways. Benji, what do you think? I, I think, I think yes. I've missed six or seven episodes, skipped, whatever. That's a lot of miles. It is. We've gotten after it. You guess 50. Uh-huh. Benji, what do you guess? How many miles here to Manistee? He just, said it. just throw out a number. guess was, I don't care. He doesn't care. <laughs> 37 miles. That's it? 37 miles. Man. But you have to go over the mountain. The state of Michigan needs to build a highway. <laughs> Between Buckley and Manistee, <laughs> the tabernacle yeah. request, the state of Michigan. Than, or, hey, if there's anybody out there with a helicopter. Oh. I tried to put it in the budget two years ago. <laughs> John denied it. I still think it could work, but. Like a Yellowstone chopper? Yep, a it's Yellowstone. got a tab logo yep. right on the side. <laughs> taking the chopper, boys. We're taking the chopper today. We got to get we have, the, we have the roof in Manistee to land on. We'd have to build something here, but I'm sure John Williams could get a crew together to build us a helipad. Oh, man. <laughs> if the tabernacle ever had it a chopper, do you think we could justify Benjamin being a door gunner? <laughs> Does the tab chopper uh, need a door, door gunner. gunner? Yeah. Could no, you? No, for deer. <laughs> then you could do first service and then second service. Oh, yeah. Dang. We could stagger them 15 minutes. Just chopper bag it. The door gunner takes a deer on the way. How <laughs> random. Where is this? Should we restart this podcast? No, this Where is episode going? 99 oh, and man. you guys have stuck with us this whole uh, time. There's no door gunners or choppers. If you've Woke listened people, to all 99 stop episodes, listening. you should share this one and say- I've made it this far. You've made it this far. <sighs> That's a lot of time. Hey, you've made it this far. Will you come a little further? Absolutely. I'm excited for next week, episode 100. Episode 100. Uh, special guest that special we special guest have planned. So make sure you tune into episode 100. Big celebration. <laughs> he has agreed to also be on 200. Yes. So get used to his and silky 300. baritone. Yep. Yeah. So make sure to tune into episode 100. But. Let's not skip past where we're at. Episode 99, allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> this is this uh, is the title? Yeah. Allegedly. allegedly. Okay. So tell us <laughs> tell us why you chose this topic. Because this wasn't in the meeting. No. But we like to be flexible. We like to yep. chuck and jive. And when I texted you last night to verify, hey, yep. are we still on plan? <laughs> are we still no. are we still on that one plan? <laughs> no. You had a total different direction. Uh, and we're flexible. So yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, just this last weekend, uh, I don't know if it was the Adam laying down some fire the week before, but Johnny V came out fresh. Mm. It was, I mean, and I was hoping I were talking about, it. it was just a really cool fired up moment. Just got us thinking, but you, uh, used a phrase that George Whitfield, yeah, George, George Whitfield. Whitfield, um, used in his ministry, but it was just this word allegedly. And you, um, led us as a congregation into this place of, are you, are you certain? And it's just, it was a very good heart check for us. Um, and I believe it was probably for you as well. Absolutely. Looking at this thought process of salvation and my surrendering to the good shepherd, everything like that. And I don't think the heart behind it was, let's get everybody questioning their salvation, nothing like that. But it did lead to a lot of people really having some time of reflection and contemplation and just asking the question, man, am have I truly surrendered my life? Am I actively living for Christ, or is this just like an allegedly thing for me? And uh, we saw people standing up in our services, which is the tabernacle is a big deal. Uh, Mm -hmm. But uh, just the conversations that were happening at the Manistee campus, and I believe at the Buckley campus as well, that that both of our campus pastors have gotten to have, and and I've gotten to have a couple as well. But it just felt right 
mm-hmm. to kind of dig into that topic a little bit of uh, salvation. How can I be sure um, that I'm saved? Or maybe if you're having doubts, here's some things that maybe you could, some lenses that you could look at those through to maybe be more aware within that. So yeah, um, but I'd love for you just to, when you were planning out that message and stuff like that, why did it allegedly feel like, kind of like this is a this is the bullet we're going to shoot here. Right. Well, we were talking about the Good Shepherd in context, and I don't know when the listener is listening to this, so just to bring you up to speed, we were in a series, or we're in this series now, but we're never listening to this, the I Am series, where we're looking at the I Am statements that Jesus made all throughout the Gospel of John. And the week that I was assigned was when he said, I am the Good Shepherd. And part of that teaching, it was in the same part of John where he also says that I'm the gate. And you can only come in and out through this gate. And then he goes on to say, I'm the good shepherd. So Jesus mixes his metaphors there, but he says, "Uh, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And then the Jewish people are like, tell us plainly, are you the Christ? And he said, you know, by my works, you know, I mean, you've watched me, you've Mm -hmm. seen all of this stuff. And he says, the reason you don't know is because you are not my sheep. Mm -hmm. You don't know my voice. My sheep know my voice and they follow me. So it begs this question, am I hearing God's voice? Am I hearing the good shepherd's voice? If I'm hearing his voice, then I know the shepherd, the shepherd knows me, and I am saved. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to back up just for a second. My intention was never to, like, cast doubt uh, for people who are saved. My intention was to see the Spirit convict people that are playing Christian or who have a mask on of faith. But no. who aren't saved. Yeah, I right? loved it. it. kind of it hit in that vein that I heard a guy talk about the book of 1 John, which we've been studying as well. And there's two lenses by which we can view that book. And I think there's two lenses that we can view your sermon is one, it creates um, a assurance for those that are in the room that are believers in Christ, because you did do a good job of assuring the people in the room that have professed Christ. Man, can you hear his voice? If you can, man, you can find hope, you can find all of that. So I think that it provided assurance, but also it did serve as a good for the people that have been playing Christian or whatever the word is you want to use there. Um, It kind of created a moment of like, wait a second, is this real for me? So I I, I think that at no point during any of the services I was a part of. So I think, I think you navigated that really, really well. So, well, there's, there's just, just one other thing before we jump into the thing, because I, Man, I'm glad you picked this topic. There's a lot to glean here, um, wherever you are in your faith journey, or maybe you can use this to help someone else. But the reason that we use the word allegedly uh, was a, a little thing that I shared with you, mm-hmm. an article I shared with you a couple, it was almost a month ago, yeah. Month, and it's not important the context, but both of us spend time on the road. We're preachers, we're evangelists, we're pastors here, just like other guys on staff, and you know, It's really easy to get puffed up. It's like, oh, look at all these numbers. Look at all these people coming to the tab. Look at all these people coming to Foundry. Look at all the, you know, Foundry and Manistee is exploding. That's awesome. Um, We have young adults that are coming. We have dudes coming to Fight Club. We have people serving. and, and, And we try to tell the stories of what God's doing at the tab. Well, George Whitfield... An evangelist from uh, the mid 1700s, right? So I guess that the way they count is that would be the 18th century. It, it's weird, but it's mid 1700s, pre American Revolution. He preached um, over 18,000 sermons on two continents, um, sometimes preaching two to three times a day to crowds anywhere from a few hundred to 30,000 mm-hmm. at a time. People would walk for miles. It's estimated. of American colonists heard him preach at least once. That's that's how prolific his preaching was. And then they would bring him the reports. Men like Benjamin Franklin, who never gave his life to Christ, as far as we can tell. George Whitfield did his best, but he never did. He was an agnostic, but he was fascinated by this guy. And and of course, he had a team of people around that are doing the counting, doing the numbers and saying, wow, you've, you know, because... Somebody told us he preached 18,000 messages, and somebody said that crowd was 30,000, and then they would see how many people made decisions for Christ. Well, whenever they brought the reports to George Whitfield, instead of getting super fired up, super excited, start believing his own press, he had a one-word answer, and the word was, allegedly. Hmm. That's all he would say. And now some of that, I think, in, in the context you and I were talking about, I think it was him trying to stay humble, trying to stay low, trying to say, well... You know, I've done my best with the gifts and the talents that I have, but I don't know every person. I don't know their heart. He can't do the discipleship for all these people. 
And so he's just saying allegedly. But some of it got me thinking is how many times have you and I seen someone make a decision, stand and raise their hand and say, hey, I want to give my life to Christ or someone come to an altar or fill out a card or someone say, from now on, I'm all in. And I've seen people do that and then fall away. That night. Like that <laughs> night. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and other times you see it's genuine. And yeah. so, so this word allegedly is kind of a haunting thing. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. No, I, I love it. And I think, because I even think to my own life, like there are so many, like the, I mean, that might change life story. There were, some, there were a couple allegedly moments, but there was a true moment where it became real for me. And so, but yeah, I think that that just led to the question that I heard a couple people ask was, how can I know? Um, and I know some people that are asking that question, you've asked it seven times and hey, you're good. <laughs> yeah. You're good. Um, yeah. But for the person that was just, it's not a fear I don't think it was a fear-based response that we saw in our congregations. I think it was one that was like, man, I really believe this, um, and I want to be certain because I, I want to change my lifestyle. But um, but I think that that was kind of just that question we, we, we saw, and so I felt like it would be good to jump in. But I think you had a, a text or was yeah, it yeah, yeah. A, a scripture so, verse. So like the first one that I want to point to is just say this isn't just a gimmick hmm. of – Preachers in 2023 to get people to move. Now, right. there were a ton of people in Buckley. You and Seth reported there were a ton of people in Manistee that in the closing moments of our services on Sunday chose to stand and say, you know what, whether saved or 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 just kind of have become complacent, yeah. right here and now, I'm going to publicly stand. Mm-hmm. And the reason we did that is because Jesus said that, that he who will not identify with me in public, I will be ashamed of him and my Father yeah. in heaven, right? And so... Jesus said it. I'm not going to argue with it. I'm not going to manipulate with that. But there was a lot of people that was that were like bothered enough that they wanted to stand. Can I say something? Yeah, As sure. a preacher watching the message, I loved, and I've learned this from you over the years, and everybody just gets to be a part of it. But your the way you do altar calls, I watch. I've watched you do them in a couple camps, and then you did it this last Sunday. There was no coercing. There was no begging or pleading. It was three, two, one. All right, let's pray. And I think that, that that's, I think we're as, a, as somebody watching and viewing in to that situation, I think it points just to that heart there. So, but I, I love that aspect. And as a young yeah. dude, it can be, because so, you and I have talked about it, yeah. right? We can talk people into making decisions. Yeah. I can use my gifts, yeah. talents, and abilities and to really negative sell way. you a used car. Yeah. But yeah. I, I loved that aspect of it. But what I loved was the immediacy mm-hmm. that we saw, at least in the Manistee first service, the one that I was really locked into, as it was incredible, just... Front row, back, because you know in the front row it's hard to stand up because you're like, am I the only one standing exactly. up right now? You but don't know what's yeah, going on on your six, It's really cool, yeah. So, but I just wanted to point that yeah. out. Well, that, here's another interesting thing with that is um, if you don't, you know, for the listener that may not know, right now we have one Saturday night service in Buckley and then two services in Buckley and in Manistee on Sunday. And Manistee has, it, has the message on a screen. On Saturday night I didn't do it. Mm. And I left on Saturday night wishing I would have done it and was like, I had to get, oh, this is confession time on the podcast. <laughs> I had to get over myself hmm. because I was born and raised in the ghetto. And it was like, man, I don't want to push people away. I don't want to use fear. And then there were some things that I know are in the word that Jesus said that helped me get over myself yeah. and say, okay, we're doing it on Sunday. I don't care if it's for one person. If That's it's good. for one person... And so Matthew chapter seven, these are the words of Christ. Uh, Jesus is teaching. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. So right there, Jesus is saying in Matthew seven, verse 21, that there's going to be some people that will say, Lord, Lord, but they're not saved. And he goes on in verse 22. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name? and do many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Mm. And so I was listening to um, a different message, one in fact that we're gonna share with our staff later, and it speaks about um, the 12 disciples that followed Jesus. And I'm not gonna turn there right now, but uh, just to summarize, uh, Jesus sent the disciples out two by two to heal in his name, cast out demons in his name, to do uh, 
or to proclaim the kingdom of God. And then again, he did it. He sent out 72 to do the same thing. So we know of those 12, Jesus lost one. Hmm. Well, he didn't lose him. The guy chose Judas to betray. And um, I don't think, well, if we fast forward to the Last Supper, Jesus says, one of you will betray me. The interesting thing is, is those guys at the Last Supper didn't look at Judas and go, I bet you it's him. Hmm. They had no idea. They're standing, I mean, they're standing around going, well, who is it? Is it, is it, is it him? Is it, you know? And then Jesus says, the one who dips with me. Judas did that, and they still didn't know. And then Judas leaves early, and they still didn't know it was him. <laughs> and then after his betrayal, right, and then he goes and hangs himself and dies and his guts bur- bur- burst out, I don't think those guys were going, um, uh, hey, man, remember when the Lord sent us out? Whenever we cast out demons, his demons never came out. Remember when we healed? Like his healings never really happened. Like we had to come in and say, yeah. I don't think they did that. I think in Jesus' name, and that's the power of Jesus' name, and that's yeah. a whole nother theological discussion. Yeah, he was doing this. Many will say, did we not prophesy in your name, Judas, cast out demons in your name, Judas, and do mighty works in your name, Judas. Mm. When Jesus fed the 5,000, Judas was one of them yeah. as part of that miracle distributing the bread and the fish. And so Jesus brought up the subject of being assured of your salvation. Now, I know that doesn't make it better right. because I'm sitting there going, you know, <laughs> there's some mighty works have been, you know, that I've been a part of that yeah. it, it, that's been done in Jesus' name, even for a preacher. It's like, man. Yeah. So there's another verse, though, that, that also kind of brackets this a little bit. And then, um, and I'll read it, and then I want to hear your thoughts yeah. on it. Okay. Philippians 2. This is Paul writing to the Philippian church. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And I think instead of making us afraid, I think he's saying, listen, don't lose your own soul. Yeah. In, in trying to look Christian, act Christian, do ministry, pay attention to your own soul. He says, with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean we can't be assured of salvation. Right. I don't believe it means that. But we can surely get distracted yeah. by doing a lot of good things, mm-hmm. doing a lot of Christian things, doing ministry things. I know that for me, man, being a part of this church for 19 years, there have been seasons where it's like, man, I got to get back to my own yeah. soul. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think about those no, two things? That's good. I, I think just even speaking to it from uh, my own personal perspective, there was just, there's so many moments where you can get so lost in what you're doing. You can get so just like uh, roped into all the boxes you're seeking to check and lose sight of who you're actually trying to check them for. Because the ministry of Jesus Christ that he has called me to, there have been quite a few moments in my own walk where it's became the ministry of Britain Bishop that Jesus is just a part of. Um, there's a podcast or a sermon that we listened to as a staff one time, and he points out to the fact that Jesus didn't die to be a part of your ministry. But I think that all of that kind of encompasses to this place of, man, who are you serving? And I think for me, when I can, especially in the recent years, find assurance and confidence and joy in what I'm doing, not as a preacher, not as a pastor, but as just somebody that is seeking to follow Jesus. And I happen to live in Northern Michigan and my job is different than some other people's, but it's because it's, there have been road, there's been barriers or not barriers, uh, guardrails put in place that have kept this focused on Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I think for the person listening to this that wants to be assured or or whatever that is, just the simple question of who are you living for? I think Jesus is very Good. clear in Luke chapter 14 when he talks about, listen, if you want to follow me, you're going to die to yourself. That's right. And so there are moments in my life, in my marriage, in me being a friend, a pastor, whatever it is, that I'm living for Britain. I'm making decisions fixed on Britain. And then there are moments where, no, I'm making clear, conscious choices that this is not me. Good. And I think that those, and it takes time and there's little touch points throughout the months or the years or whatever that I would encourage people that if you're seeking to follow Jesus, pump the brakes for a minute 
Um, because I think the moments I really start losing sight of what I'm doing is when I don't slow down. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why um, one of the Ten Commandments is to keep the Sabbath holy, is to take time to separate, to spend, to get back in the presence of God and just be. Um, and that's such a, especially where we're at regionally and just the congregation that we're a part of, that's like almost a sign of weakness that you, oh, you take a break, you know, but it's not about catching your breath necessarily as it is refixing your focus back on why you're doing what you're doing. But I think for me, whenever I look at my own salvation and uh, the assurance of that and the, the joy from that, it's. Anytime it drifts away from Jesus being that that central mm-hmm. piece, it's something that um, Charlie talked about at Man Up, that Jesus is the center and the center doesn't move, the center doesn't change. And so any time in my life where I'm experiencing doubt or, um, or I'm questioning, man, is this really what I'm supposed to be or anything like that, I can trace that back to, oh, this many weeks ago or th- just a couple hours ago or months ago, I made a decision that was going to serve Britain. Mm. And that's led to this space. Hmm. And that takes some the ability to kind of step outside of a situation, to be introspective or whatever. But it also, I've got brothers in my life. Um, I just texted Adam this last week um, while you were preaching. I texted Adam Sharp. The minute you said, the minute this comes about me, get me out of here. And I said, mm-hmm. dude, that has to be true for us at Foundry. Please, please, please check me. And he said, same here, bro. But I think that that's such a that's good, good lens by which we view things because – I've got dudes in my life that can call me out on it. I've got a wife that she calls, she loves calling me out on it. Uh, no, she's awesome. I love hope, but um, there's that's a all gift. of yeah, a hundred percent. But when I look back at these moments where I'm experiencing the enemies using lies or or um, or whatever it is to to create doubt in my life, and sometimes I think it's the spirit of God punching me in the throat. But it's ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, it's because somewhere down the path, I chose Britain instead of Jesus. Yeah. And so that would be my, for me personally, as I listen like to your first thing. Yeah, yeah. As yeah, if I'm experiencing that, I would just, man, what's the, what's the last no I said, whatever that is, mm. if I'm experiencing doubt in that space or, or am I just serving myself? Is there somewhere I need to die? Um, for the lack of, I mean, that's the way Jesus said it. Is there a space in my life where I'm not dying to self necessarily? If I'm experiencing doubt, is there a sin or whatever it is? So that's kind of my first initial work it out with fear and trembling, stuff like that is I, I think too, Paul is pointing to the simple fact that this is not a game. This isn't something to take for granted. Um, this isn't something to take lightly. Um, it's something to find joy in, to find hope in, and to to not just, but I think Paul is pointing to the weightiness of serving in the kingdom. And mm-hmm. I think that that's also important because I think a lot of people take it lightly because it's so easy here. Yeah. So You said uh, there was a lot of good stuff in there. One of the things you talked about is slowing down. You talked about rest. And you said the word Sabbath. And I'm not pointing to Sabbath as this is one of the right. assurances of, of salvation, but it just reminded me of a random text that I got from my oldest child. Mm-hmm. Um, She's thinking about stuff at work, and she says, totally random, but somewhere down the road, you should do a sermon series on the Sabbath or the idea of rest and God's intent for it. And, ooh, I mean, that I'm roped into the text now. She goes, I just realized I know very little about it, and it's probably the one commandment that I think is most ignored. 100%. And our culture actually incentivizes people to Mm. break it. Yeah. So God's people are called out of the world to be different from the world and we're actually supposed to be people that can take one day Mm. and worship and you can rest in or you can worship in rest Mm. rest is worship when you're because in that moment that you rest you're trusting god Mm -hmm. you're trusting god that you know what the dishes can wait yep uh you know what the uh the extra chores can wait uh you know what um the 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 big project that um that I have this week that can wait. This is a day to rest, love, worship, and trust God. Yeah. But if we go all the way back to, okay, how can we know? It's yeah. always a good thing. And I'm glad that you said that. And I found myself telling people this, and, and, and this isn't, well, this is related to work out your own faith with fear and trembling. Yeah. Most people that wrestle with this the most there's some reasons here, and you and I found some articles that just list yep. reasons why you might be doubting. But if you're doubting it a little bit, 
that's not always bad. Right. Because if you're not bothered by it, you're either way far down the road spiritually or you're not saved yeah. at all. Saved people want to work it out with fear mm. and trembling. And part of even the, you know, if you're dialed into this podcast because you saw the byline is, a, you know, is allegedly, and I need to know that I know that I know. If you're really that bothered by it, you probably are saved. There might be some other things at work. So right. it's good to go back to God's word and then just assure ourselves of what it says. So Romans 10, uh, um, 9 and 10, I probably quote this a lot when I'm preaching. It says simply, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses mm. and is saved. So the part about the mouth confessing, that's that public, yeah. I agree yeah. that Jesus is Lord. I confess that Jesus is Lord. This is what I believe, and I'm not ashamed or afraid to be associated with it. So when we do that, that's actually what I was doing in that service that says, hey, if you, I believe the call went this way. If you're not saved and you want to be saved today, now's the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if you've been a sheep and you've been wandering, you've been distracted, you've not been resting, you've not been taking time for God, you haven't been giving him your yes, you've been doing what you want to do. He's actually gotten the no and you're saying yes to yourself. And then the third part of that, if you've never done it publicly, that's a question I have. If you've never done it, like like you've never publicly identified with him, yeah. I'm going to give you a chance. Now, it doesn't have to just happen in church. Right. I think baptism is a public confession. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that start coming to our church, and then they start making changes in their life, and they pray silent prayers when no one sees, and they don't fill out a card, and they've, they've just been here for a while. And sooner or later, Northern Michigan man, it's time to stand up and be mm. counted, yeah. I think is what it was. So that is... With the mouth, one confesses is saved. If you know, according to Romans 10, 9, and 10, that you believe that Jesus is Lord and you believe that God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. There's yeah. assurance. So I can't tell if you really believe. Mm -hmm. I can see fruit. Right. Allegedly. Allegedly. Right. But the believing part, I think, isn't just simply a mental. Yeah. Ascent. It's good. If I really believe that God raised him from the dead, my life's totally changed. Yeah. My he always has my yes. Yeah. The stakes are that high. I'm no longer fear and trembling because I believe it right down to the ground. He has my yes. Yeah. So No, that's so good. Because that, that led there was a question in my head that as you were talking, you kind of answered it already, but I was gonna ask that what is the importance then of that public confession of faith? Because I think that and you completely answered the question, and I don't want to answer it again, but I'm gonna set up because I have an awesome text message on my phone from um, a dear friend of mine that just got sent to me today that ties directly to this. But I think we we do have so many people that come and are a part of our church that just they get plugged in, they're going to fight club, they're getting after it, they're growing, they're maturing, they're gaining more knowledge, but they haven't, well, I'm probably good. Yeah. So I, that would be my question is, I guess, like, how does that look? Is that just a, what does that response look like for somebody that maybe is listening to this and they're saying, you know, man, I got baptized when I was in eighth grade or whatever, but I've plugged back into church. I'm really enjoying this. Like, what is that public confession? And I know you said yeah, baptism. Like, yeah. what, how, well, how does that unfold? That's good. Yeah. No, that's a great question because I don't think there's a cut and dried where. Right. And so my answer would be everywhere. Hmm. So it may be... Um, okay, so it happened in eighth grade and then you wandered around and now you're 35 and you're yeah. back. Well, it might be at the table where you just say, hey guys, listen, here's my story. Mm. You know, I got baptized in eighth grade for a minute. I thought I, you know, was a part of things. And then, man, I just wandered off. Yeah. I'm back now. Yeah. I'm back because Jesus is the only way. He's my God. He's my King. I want to follow him. He says he's my friend. Yeah. Um, and I want to be his friend. I want to give him my yes. So it happened right there. Yeah. It might happen with your spouse. Mm. It might happen with your spouse. Years ago, um, this was before the pandemic, of which we will not be named, <laughs> uh, uh, in a message, and I don't even remember the context, but um, I felt like I had to say this. If you believe this, if, 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 if you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you are saved and your spouse doesn't know, 
Mm. What's wrong with you? Mm. If your parents don't know, how dare you let your parents go to their grave not knowing? If your children don't know, like it happened later in life, how dare you go to your grave and them not ever really know, right? Mm. Because the influence, this domino effect of someone, you know, like a father who, who, who finally makes that decision. Man, you tell your sons, you tell your daughters, you tell your wife, you tell, that's, that's right. all that confession. The cool thing was, is I got a text that day from a guy that uh, essentially it said, I love God and love people. And I believe in Jesus and I'm saved. And he sent it to me. And he also sent it to his mom. Hmm. And his mom texted me like right after. <laughs> I just got this text from my son. What's going on? I'm like, I think he's saved. Well, what do you think that means? I said, would you just celebrate? <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's, he's, he was in the service today because hmm. they're both a part of the church. And yeah. he's kind of been the wayward prodigal. And, and I was like, now you can die happy now. Yeah. Because he just, now, is he the guy that's going to stand up in church? And, and give a public test. Well, we don't do that anyways right. because the wackadoos have ruined that for everyone. My goldfish has been resurrected. But that's just, <laughs> my goldfish is resurrected. <laughs> but that's another example of how you do it publicly. Yeah. So it's not just in one context. It's everywhere you're given the opportunity to publicly identify with Jesus Good. Christ, I think. I yeah. don't know. What do you think? No, I, I, I think you're dead on. But I just love, I got a message last night. Oh, yeah, um, read that message. Yeah, I'm going to um, because I don't think this guy would care. As a dear friend of mine, but he texted me and he said, um, at Man Up during the God is Love song, I wrote, if God is love, why is it so hard for me to love? Question mark. Feel love? Question mark. What am I holding on to? And then he continued and he said, last night I was having a conversation until about 1130 with a friend of mine talking like we usually do, pretty deep conversation. And he mentioned, maybe I should just ask God what the roadblock is. And then we talked about being born again. Generally involves obvious change in someone's life and that I, and that, yeah, there's the clear piece that I have grown and matured, but I haven't had a real change. Well, I got home and it was a little after midnight, so I decided just to stay in my truck. I was talking to God and telling him that I really wanted to be born again. I wanted to change and not just be cold hearted anymore. I prayed that I wouldn't be me thinking, but that he would show me what that roadblock is. Almost out of nowhere, I said, I'm going to leave those parts out. And then it said, dude, I felt such a huge weight off my shoulders. I feel so much better. And, uh, and there's some stuff in there that's really, really cool, just pointing to some forgiveness and some different things that had to happen in that space. But that's a dude that's been getting after it for a while. Yeah. That I would have never asked the question, mm. but that was obedient in the moment of there's something here. I feel like the Spirit's putting on my, something on my heart. He talked to another one of our good friends, had a conversation, invited the Spirit into that space, and God used that to bring assurance out of that because, yeah. hey, you're living in some unforgiveness, um, and there's a roadblock here. Let me get rid of it for you. But I think that's a public confession. That's a dude. That is and, a public confession. And that's a yeah. terrifying text message to send to me. Yeah. Because it's going to be run right on a podcast. Well, that and that's a dude that is actively getting opportunities to do stuff at both of our campuses and different things like that. And it's like, that's terrifying. Yeah. What if they know, right? Because I think know. there's so many dudes that live yeah. in that space. That's real faith, man. I love that. You know, another thing that, that as, as you were reading that, I thought about is, is the very context that brought up this whole allegedly yeah. conversation. My sheep hear my voice mm. and they follow me. So in the, even in that moment where you're checking yourself, I'm working out my faith yeah. with fear and trembling, he asked God and he heard God's voice. Yeah. Hey, man, you want to feel my love? You got to show my love. Yeah. If you're going to show my love, you need to forgive. And, mm. it, and the spirit just did a beautiful work there. Yeah, that's awesome. He heard his voice. Yeah, I love that. Here's, a, here's, a, here's another passage about assurance. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 11 through 13. This is what they say. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have hmm. eternal life. Who is it that has the Son? It is those who have believed in him. And that's John chapter 1 
verse 12. Mm -hmm. So simply put, if you have Jesus, you have life, not temporary life, you have eternal life. And according to 1 John 5, 13, you can know that you know that you know. So the question is, do you have the son? Have you confessed him? Do you believe in him? And then I think where we feel the assurance is, are you living for him? And that's why the second part of that invitation, it was for first time believers, but people that know that they know that they know that they're complacent, they're in a rut, they're just going to church, they're just doing whatever. And it's about getting after it again. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. I think there's a thread in uh, that one of these articles we found that I want to pull for a second. Go for it. Um, I th- I think because, I, going. because I think we're hitting on all these pieces of, man, this is how you know, this is how you confess. Yeah. So why is it that we doubt? Yeah. So yeah. why is it that we doubt? This says one reason people doubt their salvation is the presence of sin in their lives. Hebrew 12 speaks of sin that so easily entangles. Many true Christians struggle against besetting, that is habitual sins, and this may cause them to doubt their salvation. That's right. So I think it was the great Puritan preacher, John, I think it was Owen, John, John Owen, I may be wrong there, but he said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Mm -hmm. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. In my own life, when I'm constantly turning to sin, when it's a habitual sin, it's a besetting sin, and there's nothing I want to do to change it, that's when doubts creep in. Yeah. So what's the... So what's the simple thing to do? Kill it. Stop sinning. Right. Just start saying no to sin and start saying yes to God. Yeah. Start walking in the light. Start, stop walking in the dark. Yeah, that's absolutely. Those are so many things we've talked about. And I think on the last episode, um, which I don't know what order these things drop in anymore, but uh, it, as we studied the book of First John, we talked about um, confession. We talked about um, having brothers or, or sisters, if you're a female listening to this, but people in your life that you can go to and confess this sin out loud, making it public. So not public in the sense of like, hey, can I get the mic on Sunday morning? I got something I need to tell people. Uh, but <laughs> but be, bringing say. those things to the light, exposing these things to the light because darkness can't exist there. And so, um, but yeah, I, I think I, when we were going through the book of First Corinthians, I got the opportunity to to talk about the brother living in unrepentant sin mm. um, and just the severity of that, even for the Corinthian church where Paul encourages them to remove this guy from their fellowship. Um, and so this unrepentant habitual sin is a problem if yes. you're listening to yes. this and you think yes. it's not that big of a deal. It's just me. It doesn't really affect anybody else. It's a problem. Right. Um, and maybe you're seeing it start to um, rear its ugly head and you doubting your salvation. Um, but I'm going to say this because I love people, but based off what we see in Scripture, what we see in the book of 1 Corinthians, what we see in some different um, areas in Paul's letters and even in um, some of the Gospels is just the simple fact that if there is active, unrepentant sin in your life, I would ask the question to your face, have you actually surrendered your life to Jesus? Mm. Um, Because if that's the case, there's a change that happens there. And uh, and that doesn't mean that things don't come in and there's not these right. trauma triggered right. sins and stuff like that that happen, but how you feel about it matters. Yeah. Um, if there's conviction that you're ignoring, okay, you might be able to find some courage in the fact that the spirit of God's convicting you of that. But if you just don't give a crap, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. So so the present. Okay, so one of the cool things that I've experienced because I've studied both sides of mm-hmm. this because there's one school of thought that wants to just really preach eternal security right down to the ground. Yeah. All you have to do is say this magic hocus pocus prayer, and then you're saved, and then you just live however you want. And yeah. then there's another camp that hates that camp so much that they start believing that uh, that a Christian somehow is going to live a sinless life. Hmm. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. In fact, I, I think I've told stories about that, of being in the old-timey churches where a man would stand up and say, well, I was saved in 1965, and in 1970, <laughs> I was sanctified, and I haven't sinned a day ever since, you know, and he was given his testimony. And even as like a 12-year-old kid, I'm like, well, you just lost the game, pal, because how about that spiritual pride mm-hmm. confessed yeah. in a testimony in church makes you look good that the last, you know, whatever— 25 years you've somehow been sinless i i'm 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 right. not buying it right so here's here's the principle sin in your life that you're okay with that you're just not doing anything about sin or the presence of sin in someone's life can be a sign that they're not saved yeah it can be and the bible never the bible tells us the direction we're supposed to go it never tells us the to the degree that we're supposed to be there and so to your point, if you're just okay with it and you're not convicted by it, you may not be saved. Yeah. If you're in the struggle, 
man, you're saved. Yeah. And you're being about that action yeah, of killing sin. Yeah. So it won't. I love this. Uh, What's another reason you got on that? Well, this quote, uh, as Adrian Rogers said, before I got saved, I was running to sin. Now I am running from it. And if I fail, I turn right around and start running away again. Yeah. And I think that that's a good word picture for um, before that moment of salvation, man, you're sprinting to sin. You probably don't give a crap about it, but now you're running away from it. And if you fail, you turn right around, you start running again. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and, and what that looks like is simply, you know, if you're doubt, you know, if you're doubting your salvation because of sin, you just confess your sin. Yeah. You know, the scripture says in first John one, nine, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive yep. you of your sin and purify you from all unrighteousness. Um, this little thing says, you know, that we're reading off of, it says another reason people doubt their salvation is the absence of godly mm. works in their lives. So it's, so it's not just turning from sin. It's yeah. also where's the fruit? Yeah. The fruit of the spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nice. Against such things, there is no law. And so is there fruit in your mm. life? Are you serving people? Yeah. You know, one of the things when people's lives get com- when their spiritual lives get complacent you know people will come to me from time well they have yeah all over the years you know what do i have to do you know just man i just don't feel god in my life you know or man i just feel so like i'm in a spiritually dry season or um you know haven't heard the voice of god one of the easy like it's who are you serving hmm. and i'm not just talking about god or yourself like literal tell me a people a or a person or a group of people that you're serving who are you, sac- where are you sacrificing? Yep. If you're not serving or sacrificing, you're probably not producing fruit because to produce fruit is hard work, man. Yeah. I mean, it's not our work, it's the Spirit's work, but as, as I'm working, the Spirit works with me. And so godly works in our lives is not something that we manufacture, but when my heart's alive to God, you know, when I'm spending time with Him, when I'm worshiping Him, when I'm yeah. being grateful for Him, when I'm killing sin, yeah. and then I'm trying to serve Him and advance the kingdom— it's a whole different thing. Oh, 100%. And I think, too, it's so many of those things complement each other, right? I, I couldn't tell you the amount of conversations I've had with people in my years of doing student ministry that the minute they started serving in student ministry, they got more fired up about following Jesus. Because as um, Paul talks about imitate me as I imitate Christ, they have felt this new burden to be killing sin in their life because they wanted to be a good godly example of what it looks like to chase after Jesus. So you kind of see those things start to complement each other. But I think the space that obviously every time we talk about this, I think is good to hit on is make sure you're not working for your salvation, but you're working from it. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Because I think we t- we've had a couple good. of podcasts and this comes up often, but for people, don't let works be how you assure yourself, but be assured because you're working. I don't know if oh, that makes really, sense the way I said it. Real good okay. sense. Yeah. So, but I think just so many people. It's subtle, but yeah. it's huge. Yeah. And I, myself included in that, there have been a lot of moments where it's like, man, what are you working for? But I think the ultimate thing is, what are you working from? Or, and I think that's the key piece. And then so that, I mean, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's by grace through faith you've been saved, not by works that nobody can boast. But you have been, there are works that have been set apart. Verse 10, all of that, go study it on your own. So, Good works are a good thing. I think they're a right. side effect of your salvation. Um, I think you cannot avoid it if you've been saved. And I think that God has set things before you ever even thought about it in place for you to settle into based off your spiritual gifts and the talents he's given you, the time he's given you, the place he's put you. Um, some, some, I mean, being a mechanic can be a spiritual gift. How can you mm-hmm. use that in a, in a beautiful way? In a, in a way that he can bless. So, yeah, but I think knowing why you're doing what you're doing is important because that can lead to doubt. Yes. If I'm working for the sake of being assured oh, for my man. salvation, that can lead to doubts because sooner or later you're like, man, this work isn't enough. You're right. Scripture is clear. It's not enough. Have you confessed? Have you, by grace through faith, received that free gift? Now work from it, not for it. So Right. So there was, there was something that you um, – there was something that you just said that got me thinking about another text message that I, you, you know what the cool thing is, is People no one stop is, texting yeah, us. they're going to stop texting Which, us. I'm but, just saying I wouldn't be. No. You're not going to be sad. <laughs> you're not going to be sad I'm about just kidding. if it never happens again. <laughs> so um, this is a guy who uh, was in my fight club and he just sent, 
this amazing text. I, I can't find it right now because I, I didn't know I was going to use it. And you're laughing over there because I'm probably. You know, you can just search it at the a top. Little, you can yeah, type his name. I don't know what he you said. You can even type what he the said. The problem is it's one of those huge uh, group group texts. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got John it. John Familia hates yeah. group texts. Okay. He goes, today I'm at work, spot cleaning walls, trimming doors. A part of me really wonders after 11 years at this job how I could be on my hands and knees cleaning when I have so many other skills. But then I remembered who I work for. I remembered when I started here. I was tasked with the same job. Back then, I was arrogant and prideful and did not do my work with gratitude. I did not have a real awareness of who I was working for. In our fight club, we talked about whatever you do, hmm. work is under the Lord. That work is worship. Yeah. It's all an attitude thing. He says, today, I'm grateful God has allowed me a second chance to do this work with a posture of humility and grace. Today, I realized I'm much more than the man God made me to be in humility and obedience than I ever was in pride and arrogance. I recognize I will not receive the recognition or accolades I believe I deserve, but ultimately, I recognize my heart posture is what matters. Like Christ, I'm called to serve and not to be served. I will do this work with the excellence today, knowing who I really work for. Today, I hope he will receive the glory he deserves by my conduct and work instead of wondering how I will be recognized. And I wanted to share that in, insight I have with you guys today, and I hope you're all having a great day. The responses from the dudes in my fight mm. club blew me away. I'm not going to read yeah. all of them to you because they were like, wow, that's powerful. Yeah. And here's a gifted and talented dude who at the job that he's at was assigned a crap job. Yeah. And that's evidence of a transformed life, yep. a transformed heart, a mm. transformed man. Back to your point, it's that perspective. Why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? Who's my God? Who's my master? And not just that, who's my friend? Yeah. You know, Jesus said, now I call you friends, friends yeah. right? So yeah. there's two other reasons here. One is sometimes it's because we were saved so young, mm. we don't remember the moment. I think an easy answer for that person, if you don't have the assurance of salvation because it happened when you were young and you're like, yeah. well, I didn't really understand. Sometimes that's true. Yeah. Sometimes someone just kind of goes along because everyone else did, but it's not always necessarily true because being saved has nothing to do with your knowledge. Mm. Doesn't, you know, how sophisticated you are, uh, how much theology that you've got, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but sometimes it is. No, a hundred percent. Sometimes it is. I think too, there's so many times where you're talking about sharing your faith or people's testimonies and I was like, well, I, I wasn't in jail for 35 years and then Jesus <laughs> met me in the cell and I got, my whole life was changed and my testimony. But I think some of my favorite testimonies that I get to hear and, and listen to are the people like, yeah, I've been following Jesus since third grade. I'm like, that's way harder than me doing whatever I want for the past 30 years and then all of a sudden changing my mind. Right. So, <laughs> because it wasn't working. Right. Yeah. But I, I think uh, for those people that maybe that's you or that's the camp you land at, man, find find joy in that. Um, I'd love the prayer that we see David in the Psalms pray, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Mm. Try to go back to third grade. Um, ask the God, man, what was that moment? Remind me of that moment. Restore to me that moment. Fire me up again. I might be a 40 that's something a year old, way to say stay that. at home yeah. mom. Restore to me the joy of my salvation because I'm losing it sometimes. I forget how far you've brought me, how good you've been to me. Um, so, but I think for those people, oh, that's, yeah, what is that Psalm? Uh, Psalm 51. Yeah. Is that, the, oh, that, and that's a confession Psalm. Yep. Yeah. Where it's, uh, create in me a clean heart. Yep. Restore oh, to me the joy of my salvation. Yeah. Yep. Renew a right spirit yep. within me. Now, I think also for sometimes the reason that we doubt is when we can't forgive ourselves, mm. when we've confessed to God, but we're hanging, that seems to be a persistent, probably that one of the biggest problems yep. in church is I can't get over the past. Well, you can't change the past, right? but you can change right now. Yeah. Either believe that he did it or not. Read yep. Ephesians chapter one again, figure mm -hmm. out what your identity in Christ yeah. is all about, that you're a son, that you're a friend, that you're adopted. I mean, Adam Sharp ripped my face off in that sermon. Yeah. When, um, and I think it's related to this. Uh, Adam preached his first ever sermon. Uh, in the big house, yeah. right, and crushed it. And for those people, Cru that are like, he didn't crush it. God crushed it. Well, here's but my thing too. This is this is the thing that everybody at the church sees, and they're like, "Man, his first time up there, he killed it." No one remembers or sees, except for us, right? Because we have the perspective. For two years, a year of that being as a volunteer, that dude was working. 
He was working and preaching. Crafting, yeah. creating content, writing messages, having conversations. It, that wasn't a— That didn't come out of nowhere. No. Yeah, and that I was think, God changing But I think him, sometimes that happens, life, yeah. and you see that in people at our church. Man, I never would have— Oh, he's natural. I would have never thought. And it's like— Oh, well, you, no. No, they don't <laughs> yeah. know all the work right. in the military he, he did when, when he had to be trained— it, because he was a trainer. Yep. And so he had to be trained in how to speak. Yeah. And then when God gets a hold of his life, he had to be trained in the word. He was trained at a fight club table. Yeah. He was trained with the after hour stuff yep. and the text. He was trained as he's preparing messages for students. Yep. He's all, he asked more, qu- you and Adam asked more questions about preaching and, and theology than anyone else on our team, hands down, because you're humble and you guys want to learn. Yeah. So in that message, back to the message, yeah. He pointed out something that wrecked me, and it wrecked him. Both of us were like, whoa, I did not know that. I wanted him to stop all the rest of the message and just (laughs) preach about it. He said, in Jewish culture, uh, you know, when we read stuff about about sons, that a biological son could be disowned. Hmm. I could just decide I'm done with Benji. I'm done with all his music and all his his filth and just say (laughs) he's out. Nothing more to do him. But, bro, that would never happen. I love you more in my own life. Uh, <laughs> but an adopted son, mm. you could never disown under the law. Yeah. You were always attached. And in Ephesians, it says, in Christ, if you're in Christ, we've been adopted. I was like a little puddle. <laughs> right. I was like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Because all of matter. us. And words matter. Yeah. There's he assurance. Just, he could have just called us sons. Yes. But words matter. That's and right, I that's think right. that that pointing out that point of adoption, and I love that that was huge. We have dudes that do the study that that's we can right. be encouraged by that. Thank you, Adam Sharp. Yeah, but I think another piece that you're hitting on, and that kind of concludes this, and we've talked about it a lot, is another thing that leads to a ton of doubt in our lives is shame. Shame. Oh yeah, that's and that, the killer. That, that connects to what you're talking about um, concerning salvation. It's persis- persistent guilt over past sins. Yeah, um, and it's trusting that was was Jesus enough for my sin? Or it's believing the lies or whatever the enemy's feeding you that, that he's, he's using to leverage for, against you for shame, that he's killing, stealing, and destroying. That's all he's doing in that space. But I think that's, that's a big source of doubt um, for people trying to follow Jesus is shame over who they were or what they've done. Right. If uh, you ever read the book of Romans, and I would encourage people that want to grow, one of the coolest challenges I ever received is someone said, set aside an hour, two hours. Uh, for me, it happened on an airplane between uh, uh, North America and Europe and read the book of Romans cover to cover. You know, instead of reading it little chunks, and yeah. that's not easy to do. You, you might want to pick up that CBD Bible for that, or maybe the New Living Translation <laughs> or the, or the, I was actually- CSB. Re- CSB, right. People are out there looking for one. Yeah, they are. Man, they but- are. Read it cover to cover and follow the train of thought. And you start with Romans 1 and 2 and how, you know, the decadence of man and and because of our sin, because we've exchanged the image of God for idols, you know, the wrath of God is coming. But then it says at just the right time. Oh, and it says, and and by the way, we're all sinners. Mm -hmm. But at just the right time, he sent his son. And then it starts building with the gospel and building what happens between sin and my flesh versus the law and how grace intervenes. And, you know, then you get to Romans 7. It says, oh, the things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things mm-hmm. that I do, I don't want to do. And, 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 and it's like a dog chasing his tail. It's like, but I don't want to do what I do. And what I do, I don't want to do. Who will save me from this body of death? And scholars will argue about that. That's in Romans 7. The end of yeah. Romans 7 is, is, you know, some guys are like, well, Paul's not Paul's not really talking about himself. He's talking about himself before Christ. Well, maybe, but it might also be Paul's recognizing his own sin right now. Paul's working out his own sin or his own faith with fear and trembling, right? Yeah. But he comes to the end of Romans 7. He says, who will save me from this body of death? Praise be that happens in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Romans 8, verse 1, one of the best verses in all the Bible. There is therefore now... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hmm. There is no condemn. So there's no. So the shame that we put on ourselves, that's from us. Yeah, that's not from God. Right. When we're saved, there's no condemnation. That's good. Now, 
if I start chasing after sin again, like we mentioned before, yeah. I'm going to start feeling that. Ch- There's a different in shame and conviction. There you go. That's conviction yeah. saying you need to quit your sin and yep. be killing sin or it will be killing you. Yeah. And part of the killing that sin does to you, it it makes you feel defeated. It makes you uh, doubt your salvation. Uh, it, it saps the power out of your life. Yeah. And and for me, when I know that I'm walking in the light and I know I'm pleasing God, I'm forgiving, I'm loving, I'm serving, mm. I'm sacrificing, I'm being grateful, like the text I read from yeah. my buddy to that fight club. When, it, when I know who I work for, who I belong to, who loves me, and how I'm loving others because of him, oh man, mm. then I walk in that freedom. Yeah. And then back to our first John study, that's what walking in the light looks like. Absolutely. Yeah, I love the book of Galatians. It says it's for freedom you've been set free, not to be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So I think for those that um, have confessed Christ, that are seeking to live for him, that have said yes to him, that are actively chasing after him, his desires for your life, you're killing sin, walk in that freedom, live in that freedom. Don't let that burden um, be placed back on you. And that doesn't mean that you just get to willy nilly do whatever you want. Mm. But there is so much freedom in following Jesus. And if you if you stood up or you had that moment or if you've had that conversation, don't let the enemy sneak back in with lies. And because and, 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 all he's trying to do is kill and destroy. So for those of you that have had that moment of confession, that, that believe in your heart, maybe it was a long process that led to that. Maybe it was whatever it was. Find hope, be encouraged, get after it. Yes, and I think that that's that's the biggest thing, and and have conversations when you need to, need to have them. Um, get in community. That's a great reason why you mm-hmm. go to a fight club or a tab women group um, or foundry or or whatever it is. Um, those groups aren't for the sake of anything other than continuing to equip the believer. Um, and I think that for the people that go to them, they know that, and for the people that keep them at arm's length. You can keep thinking it is what it's not, but at the end of the day, it's for you and it's for other people, and it's not about anything other than that. But I think those are great places because those are things that, as you and I are talking, those are the places we pull these stories from. It's dudes that are getting into community, that are doing it together. So, yeah, that would be my encouragement. If you're struggling with that, surround yourself with people that can call out um, call out maybe the sin in your life, but also can encourage the parts of you that are really, really good, um, that, that it's clear that Jesus is working in and through your life. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully we encourage somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully and the sun and by out. the way, if you're still on the struggle bus, come talk to a pastor. Yeah, man. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Or someone, you know, a leader in your group or something like that because, yep. yeah. Yeah. And if you listen to this podcast and you know, maybe you're not near the tabernacle, um, I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, if you don't live in a place where you can physically come to our church, we might not be your church. Go find a church you can belong to where you can be seen, you can be known, where you're not just consuming, you're not just clicking when it's convenient. Going to church is inconvenient. I agree. I have to go to church on Saturday sometimes and I don't want to. (laughs) <laughs> but it's okay. And, and that's that's a strong encouragement that I think. Find a church. Yeah, find Even a church, church that you're plugging into, that you're going to physically. Um, let this, um, we're glad that the tabernacle can be a resource maybe to complement your discipleship process, but we never, never, never intended yes. for this to be a replacement for belonging to a local body. So if you're out there in Abu Dhabi, find yourself a church. If hey, you're, shout out to our listeners in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, yeah wherever because you're apparent, at. Because apparently we got some right. that are Absolutely. right over there. Yeah, but find I mean, a church, plug it. into I mean, a church. I mean, that's an exception. Yeah. You know, hey, we're in a place where we can't worship live. Yeah. Okay, we'll start a secret small group yeah, or something. Two or three. You know? Yeah. Two or more. But man, if you're here in North America and, yep. and you're just, you know, doing pajamas church, yep. Maybe for a season, but yeah, that find a local church. Dead. Get yeah, off that horse. Is, yeah, come on, <laughs> get off the horse. That Go horse on, is man. dead. Yeah, because there's a there's a local community that's dying for you not to just know this stuff, but to be it. And I think that's important as Good well. Commercial. Um, so well said. Yeah, absolutely. Sun's coming out sometime. Episode ninety nine. Yep, it's about to be brat season here in Northern Michigan. I, dude, I would <sighs> allegedly, allegedly, allegedly on those brats. Hey, if you're in a meatpacking plant, <laughs> that's what I'm going to start. And you're listening to this right here. Hey, somebody, somebody reached out and said they're sending us brats. That's going to start being my response to you. Allegedly, yeah. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. Trace, trace cakes, trace cakes are delicious treats. Yeah. Allegedly, 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 allegedly. Yeah. Skylar Bibles, allegedly. Just kidding. They're <laughs> awesome. If I ever got a free Bible from this podcast, I'd retire immediately. Oh, wait, don't no. do that. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, I love it. Chick Fil A. 
allegedly. Mm. Benji. Allegedly. He is our producer, yeah. allegedly. <laughs> Love it. Hey, Tab family, until next time, this is John, Benji, and Britton signing off. Yeah.